when, when Jenny asked me to do this talk, I said yes, and I've been away. And last night I looked at the title. Uh, I thought I'll, I'll put some thoughts together. I wasn't planning to do a presentation. And when I saw the title, it reminded me of a talk I'd done in 1998. Uh, I'd, been, I'd been asked to do a talk on mental health in 2015. And I, I pulled up that lecture, and I was very pleased that I had predicted I apt. I, not not I, but, but I'll, so I'm, I'm going to show you a few slides. So I, I took some from there, and then I've added out to what we've learned since then to say where we might be heading in the future. And this is what I said in 1998. Uh, this is fairly simple. It's very obvious that there will be continuing demographic changes. Uh, I, I didn't uh, put it there because we didn't expect the scale of immigration, but the one thing you could add further to that is that society will become much more diverse than it was even uh, from 1998. We have an aging population. We have a lot more social isolation, a lot more fragmentation of social networks. Uh, so where the where people went for traditionally for, for support and help and guidance, those things will increasingly fall into, into our remit. Um, I thought in 1998 that there was going to be uh, increasing separation between primary and secondary care in the sense that non-psychotic mental disorders will move to GPs and psychiatric services will become more and more serious mental illness oriented and that, seemed, that, does, that has happened. Uh, and I also thought that CMHTs in the form that they were in, in the 90s would be unsustainable. They were doing everything. Uh, and because they were doing everything, they were not doing many things very well. Uh, so I, I, I felt that we would have specialist teams. Uh, and I also felt, which, which hasn't happened, is that perhaps we would move away from OT, CPN, social worker. We might develop a generic mental health worker. That, that really hasn't happened. I think the, the dis interdisciplinary boundaries are quite rigid. Um, and, and I felt that you know, we will go towards part privatization of the NHS, which again seems to have happened. And this was where I, I thought I have something like I have would be needed. Uh, it was, you know, we have become increasingly psychologized as a society. We clearly understand the you know, psychological roots of our distress. We are no longer a, willing to accept it as, as divine punishment of our past life. Uh, and so in our, in our popular culture, you, know, you, have, you have people... Uh, protagonist always has a troubled life in the past. We are increasingly aware of the roots of our distress. And I felt that at that time I was running a CMHT. It was very obvious to me that there were a number of people referred by GPs who were too complex for the GP, but not complex enough for us. And they were falling through the gap. And it was very obvious what they needed was not secondary mental health care, but not primary mental health care, something in between. And that, I think, I act as there to fill that, that, that gap. So since then, what, what has happened is the very important thing that has happened is that we now have solid, robust evidence for the efficacy of certain psychotherapies, CBT being a good example. We have randomized controlled trials of CBTs, and, and CBT therapists can stand up and say, we have firm evidence, firm scientific evidence. It works. Uh, as a result of which, psychotherapies like CBT are now part of the NICE recommendations. Uh, we are expected to deliver them uh, as a health service. In the academic arena, we have now started understanding the difference between a mechanism and a meaning. When I was training, you know, we used to tell patients, oh, you've got psychosis, or your family member has psychosis. It's a chemical imbalance in the brain. It's right, but it's not the entire answer. The chemical imbalance is the mechanism of symptom production. So I could give any one of you drugs that treat uh, Parkinsonism. Dopamine in your brain will increase, and one of the side effects is you might start hearing voices. So the cause of hearing voices is not dopamine increase, it's what caused the dopamine increase. So now we understand the dopamine increase or monoamines in depression is a mechanism by which symptoms are produced. But what causes that increase is much more likely to be in the 
social life of the individual. So we are now coming to a happy marriage between psychosocial influences and biological influences. It's been a sterile debate in psychiatry. It's been a futile, sterile debate between psychotherapy and medication, between life events and, and biology. And actually, all of us who are good at mental health will know that there's a truth in both. These are different perspectives. And that's been a very useful thing to have happened. That's brought us together as clinicians. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a social psychiatrist. And what we've been able to show is that the brain is not a fixed static organ. It changes in response to uh, what happens in your life. There was a very interesting study from London showing that taxi drivers had larger areas of the brain, the hippocampus, which is a map reading area, as compared to non-taxi drivers. And the longer you'd been driving a taxi, the larger that area was. So here's a good example of the brain changing in response to you know, life experiences. Another very interesting study shows that successful treatment with an antidepressant or with psychotherapy produces the same brain changes. So, so psychotherapy produces the same, successful psychotherapy does the same thing to the brain that successful antidepressant treatment is. So you can say, well hang on, there is firm evidence that successful psychotherapy does the same thing. And, and so now what, what we can say is that there are places where medication is necessary, there are places where psychotherapy will do as well, and there are places where you need both. And again, I think that that merging of different disciplines has been very good for, for, for us and our clinicians. So, so my important lesson that I've learned from social psychiatry is that if you can change your mind, you can change your brain. We always felt you could, it was the other way around. And finally, the big advance in our knowledge has been gene environment interactions. So again, people used to think there are genes which make you ill, or there are environments that make you ill. And now we know that you have genes which are triggered on and off, depending on which environment you're in. Uh, and we know that in certain conditions, cannabis is a very good example. I don't know how many of you know, but cannabis and psychosis is related through a particular gene called COMT. If you have one variant of the gene, you have very high risk of developing psychosis if you take cannabis. If you have another variant, you don't have high risk. So when people argue about whether cannabis causes psychosis or not, they forget that there is an intermediate, which is the gene. We, we know there are studies from Holland showing that your vulnerability, which is genetically determined, gets expressed into illness depending on what kind of life events you have. There's a very interesting uh, product now where you can predict whether somebody will respond to clozapine or not. I think this, this will be the next big advance. And, and I think psychotherapy may, may also uh, come into the remit of some, some kind of a gene environment interaction.